Good afternoon. Um, for, you, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eileen Kunkler. I'm the Assistant Director of the Center for Slavic and East European Studies. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Um, I encourage you, if you're not familiar with us, please look at our newsletter, our website. Um, today is our first experiment in social media and live streaming lectures, so uh, please, please bear with us, um, but in the future, uh, look to those sources for information on the activities and events that we're hosting. Today is our first lecture of the semester, and we're pleased to have Professor Elena uh, Nikolaenka, an associate professor of political science from Fordham University, and she will be discussing her most recent book, Youth Movements and Elections in Eastern Europe. Uh, professor Nikolai Nikolaenka, <laughs> research interests include comparative democratization, social movements, political behavior, women's activism, and youth, um, especially as they relate to Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. In her talk today, she will focus on a Serbian case study, um, but at the end, um, there will be time for Q&A. She'll talk for about 45 minutes, and then in the Q&A, she can go into some of the other case studies um, from her book. So please save the questions until the end so that we can have um, the full time for, for her presentation. And join me in welcoming and for a warm welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at uh, <coughs> the university. Um, just uh, before we start, just one question. Can you see the slides or no? Here on this no, screen. It's not going to be No? No? It's okay. It's, oh, just, it's just us. Oh, okay, okay. Just because so that they're helpful. <coughs> okay. Um, so our time uh, in different uh, countries, uh, different social contexts, uh, youth acted as agents of social change. Uh, and uh, in the book uh, that I have recently published, uh, I examine how young people in Eastern Europe uh, played a prominent role in pushing for social change in non-democracies that has emerged since the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, it's quite striking how in the post-Soviet period, at the turn of the 21st century, a wave of youth movements uh, uh, spread up uh, across the post-Soviet space. And it all began uh, arguably uh, with the emergence of uh, the Serbian youth movement Otpor, which literally means a resistance. Uh, in Serbia, a group of university students at the University of Belgrade uh, set up this uh, social movement and uh, it grew into an extensive network of youth activists across the country. Uh, with more than uh, 100 branches uh, throughout Serbia. Uh, they pushed uh, for uh, political change uh, through free and fair elections uh, uh, and um, in part uh, uh, due to youth mobilization, uh, this youth, uh, this, uh, the citizens of Serbia succeeded in bringing down Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, uh, and uh, this example inspired youth activists in other countries to set up similar social movements and push for political change at the time of national elections. So just within three months after Milosevic's downfall in Belarus, a group of activists gathered in the Belarus Kapusha a forest range that has a lot of symbolic meaning for many Belarusians uh, and uh, uh, unveiled the plan to form the youth movement called Zubr, which literally means bison. The bison is a national symbol of Belarus. Uh, uh, there is a very popular myth in Belarus that bisons don't live in captivity and that's what they try to convey through this name, that Belarusians would not tolerate any further uh, authoritarian practices in the country. And then uh, in 2003, uh, a group of Georgian uh, students set, set up the youth movement uh, uh, named uh, Kmara, which literally means enough, implying that uh, they are fed up with corruption and poverty in the country. 
uh, and they want to see some uh, drastic political change on the eve of the 2003 parliamentary elections. This wave of youth activism continued uh, uh, in 2004, when not just one, but two youth movements with the same name, Para, which literally means it's time, were formed by different groups of young people uh, on the eve of the presidential elections. And finally, in 2005, uh, several uh, youth groups named Maka, which again literally means it's time, Unifikir, you think it and go, no, uh, were formed on the eve of parliamentary elections to demand political change. Uh, so, all these youth movements had uh, a lot, many similarities, uh, had many things in common, and um, uh, the cross national diffusion of ideas explains it to a great extent why they shared a lot of common characteristics. Uh, first of all, almost all of these youth movements, with the exception of Otpor and the Unifiki, were formed during the time of national elections. Uh, youth activists felt that elections provide an opportunity for social change. Um, and of course, uh, as far as the government is concerned, uh, they looked upon elections as a uh, an instrument for regime stability. So it, it all depends on the perspective. Uh, but uh, uh, many youth activists felt uh, that uh, elections is just uh, a great opportunity, present a great opportunity uh, for ushering in political change. Uh, and that's why the issue of free and fair elections became salient during that time. And in addition, youth activists called for press freedom. Uh, and academic freedom, since uh, uh, university students uh, constituted the core of uh, uh, these youth movements. Uh, and uh, they shared a set of similar protest tactics. Uh, a lot of them uh, used the stickers, um, <coughs> uh, performed the street performances um, uh, in, the, in the street, uh, uh, or organize a rock concert in an attempt to try and mobilize youth. Uh, and uh, here you can see on the slide uh, just uh, uh, some illustrations of how ideas traveled from one country to another. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the first uh, image here at the top are the logos for the two youth moments. This is for Soviet Outpour. Um, and uh, this is for Georgia Square. And you can see in both images uh, um, uh, the clenched fist. Uh, I actually spoke with some youth activists, Georgian youth activists, who were involved in uh, deliberations related to the adoption of this symbol. And they said that they had uh, very extensive discussions on how to represent the movement, Kvara. Um, but in the long run, uh, they decided that uh, the, clenched fist, uh, the clenched fist is the best. It's a universal symbol of resistance. Uh, but also, uh, in the context of Georgia, they used uh, in the past uh, to, during protest events. So, so it had some sort of cultural resonance to Georgia specifically. So they just tweaked a little bit this, uh, the visual representation of the, of the clenched fist. You see, they just changed the background from black to white. Uh, and wrote down, of course, you know, the, the name of the movement in Georgia. Uh, and uh, uh, graduates of um, earlier electoral revolutions share their expertise with uh, youth activists in the region. Uh, so uh, Ukrainian youth activists, for example, studied very carefully the experience of uh, civic activists in Belarus. Uh, and uh, they uh, compiled the whole library of posters that had been previously produced by the Serbian, by the uh, Serbian, uh, by the Belarusian youth movement Zubru. So here are the illustri is another illustration of just how these ideas traveled from one country to another. Um, these are two posters produced by two different youth movements. The first one was produced in Belarus. Uh, in 2001 on the eve of the presidential elections and the second one in Ukraine 
uh, on the eve of the 2004 presidential elections. So here you can see at the top they have the slogan, uh, it's time to clean up. Uh, uh, and uh, the implication is that it's time to remove the incumbent president from power. Uh, and uh, to represent this idea, usually they placed here the image of a man stepping on an insect. Um, so uh, Ukrainian uh, designers really liked this idea and decided to adopt it to the local context. Uh, so, in, so they replaced the insect. <laughs> uh, it's not uh, incidental uh, because uh, uh, at the time the incumbent president of Ukraine, Leonid Kuchma, uh, was um, formerly nicknamed as the brown spider. So they placed the spider here, <laughs> some kind of uh, spider, and then. Um, uh, yeah, they, they, they replace the slogan slightly, so instead of it's time to clean up, it's time to advance, uh, to move forward, which is, uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, um, the designers told me that uh, uh, he really didn't uh, like this uh, image of the office show. <laughs> it just it didn't convey a strong image uh, of uh, a revolutionary force that is a good that is about to crush uh, the government. Uh, so he found that the military boot would be more appropriate. And then he placed uh, the image, uh, the logo of the youth movement on the, on the soul uh, to uh, underscore uh, who is going to be responsible for, uh, for dismantling the current regime. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, this, so this is how um, you know, youth activists learned from each other. Uh, and uh, try to uh, uh, slightly modify some tactics, uh, some ideas that have been previously used in one context uh, to suit uh, the situation in other contexts. So, so, uh, so overall, you know, it's, it's really quite striking how many similarities were, could be observed across the youth movements. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they differed in the extent to which uh, they were successful in mobilizing citizens and particular young people against the regime. So this is the research question that I pose in the book. Why were some youth movements more successful than others in mobilizing youth against the regime? And here I define a success in terms of the mass mobilization, uh, not the outcome of electoral revolutions in these countries, uh, because a wide uh, range of factors uh, explains uh, why um, in some cases uh, uh, the autocratic incumbent uh, had to step down and others uh, consolidated his power even further. So as indicators of movement success, I use uh, the size of the youth movement uh, and uh, I also distinguish uh, two types of youth political participation um, because uh, uh, it was critical for young people not just to go in the streets and protest in the aftermath of elections, but also to come to the polling stations before elections themselves, no matter how fraudulent they were. Uh, some research suggests that when the voter turnout is higher, then it might be more difficult for the government to uh, tamper with the results uh, uh, and uh, you know, to do uh, ballot stuffing, uh, things like this uh, that would uh, really uh, um, undermine uh, the uh, validity of the elections. Uh, um, so, uh, as far as electoral participation is concerned, I use uh, such indicators as youth voted to now and youth vote for the political opposition. And then, uh, as a proxy for youth participation in post-election protests, I use the size of post-election protests as a whole. Um, these are not uh, perfect measures and if you have any questions you're in q and I can answer them um, uh, you know, but th this is just a proxies um, that they can capture certain trends so, uh, so uh, it's very difficult to uh, assess uh, with a, a great degree of certainty how big these youth movements were uh, because unlike uh, uh, political parties uh, you know, they didn't uh, uh, keep maybe good records of the membership uh, and in part it was done for security reasons uh, uh, because they were operating in a repressive political environment. And then 
In the aftermath of these events, uh, when I met uh, civic activists uh, and uh, movement leaders and asked them, you know, so how big is your movement? Of course, you know, a lot of them were inclined to exaggerate, you know, they all wanted to um, uh, suggest that they were really strong. So, uh, 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 so, so this, um, and also in, in another methodological kind of issue that a new researcher faces, uh, one tries to assess the size of these youth movements uh, or social movements in general is what do you define by a uh, member of the movement because some individuals, some youth, young people might have participated in protest events but did not uh, seek any sort of formal affiliation with the movement uh, uh, and uh, some might have contributed to youth movement operations uh, uh, but would not count as movement activists. Uh, so, so this is a little bit murky, but by and large I think all analysts would agree that uh, 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 that uh, the youth movement in Serbia uh, was the largest. Um, they had uh, cells uh, spread out uh, throughout the country. Uh, it was not uh, for, for concentrated just in the capital city of Belgrade. Uh, and uh, some uh, reports claim that they had as many as 70,000 people. So uh, if you uh, convert it uh, to a percentage of the youth population, aged between uh, 15 and 29, uh, it's approximately 4.5%. Uh, it, 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 and you can see for, for other cases it's, it's, it's uh, much, much smaller. Um, and. Uh, um, even uh, in the case of Ukraine, it, it's still well, 35,000 people, you know, this number uh, might be too big, uh, but uh, it's uh, still less than 1% of the youth population of the country as a whole. In, uh, uh, during all those electoral revolutions, you know, uh, the capital city was the center stage of protest events, um, and uh, that's where a lot of action was happening. Uh, and uh, in uh, the case of uh, uh, Azerbaijan, for example, you know, they had approximately 100 members each and most of them were based in the capital city of Baku. Uh, the, the, uh, so, uh, and um, uh, and in, in Belarus, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, it was uh, maybe around 5,000. Uh, people uh, around the time of the 2001 presidential election um, and, and uh, so you can see that there are some variations across uh, across the youth movements uh, um, and uh, uh, I think uh, with the voting data we can see maybe more clearly we can establish more confidently cross-country differences in youth political behavior uh, usually, uh, vote uh, turnout is higher in presidential elections than in parliamentary ones. Um, uh, and uh, that's why maybe it's not surprising that, uh, you know, in uh, Serbia and Ukraine, uh, vote turnout uh, and in, uh, it was quite high. Uh, and this is, uh, again, it's based on public opinion polls. So here people, again, tend to overestimate the level of their participation, this public opinion polls tend to overestimate the level of um, youth participation uh, in elections, but still uh, it's quite striking how um, in Serbia uh, in particular um, 9 out of 10 people, young people, claim that they voted in elections. Um, you know, for comparison, I think in the United States usually youth voted an out uh, is below 50%, less than half of young people vote. In, in Serbia at that time, uh, during the 2000 elections, uh, uh, a large number of first-time voters uh, participated in elections. Uh, and uh, uh, most uh, young people who did vote in Serbia vote for a position candidate, approximately 80%. Um, and, uh, uh, when I compare Ukraine and Belarus, you can see that youth voter turnout was quite high in both countries, more than 80% of 
um, young people in both Belarus and Ukraine participated in the presidential elections. Uh, but uh, in Ukraine, um, more or less, um, almost, one th uh, almost two thirds of uh, young people voted for a position political candidate, while in uh, Belarus, um, less than one third voted for the opposition political uh, candidate. So the majority of young people did not side with the uh, political opposition at that time. Um, and the similar trend is observed when you compare Azerbaijan to Georgia. Youth to voter turnout uh, uh, is uh, similar, but as far as uh, uh, general support for the political opposition is concerned, uh, in uh, Georgia uh, it was much, much higher for uh, charismatic, uh, such a charismatic political leader as Mikhail Saakashvili compared to opposition political figures uh, uh, in uh, Azerbaijan. So we can see that there are some discernible differences in youth voter turnout and the size of post-election protests and the lines of post-election protests also differed across these countries. Um, and uh, uh, these are the numbers for the largest uh, reported size of post-election protests that happened in the capital city in the post-election period. Uh, so in Ukraine, uh, for example, they claim that um, uh, many media reports claim that as many as one million people at one point uh, gathered in downtown Kiev. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, um, uh, for comparison, in uh, Belarus, um, um, barely maybe 5,000 people um, assembled um, in the post-election uh, period and uh, uh, the protests uh, lasted for a shorter period of time. Uh, in Azerbaijan, uh, civic actors uh, were allowed to organize the protest rallies only on four different occasions. In November, while in Georgia the protest campaign lasted a longer period of time and they were able to stay um, on, the, on, on the square for, um, without uh, as much interruption uh, and as much violence uh, from the police. So the argument that I make in the book is uh, that uh, uh, the level of user participation is affected uh, by tactical interactions between the youth movements and the incumbent governments. And uh, tactical interaction implies uh, that uh, uh, it, it implies that it, this is a dynamic process where on the one hand uh, civic activists uh, try to uh, come up with novel innovative tactics uh, to challenge the regime, and on the other hand, uh, the incumbent government uh, tries uh, to counteract uh, um, and uh, introduce a set of um, uh, strategies, a set of moves uh, uh, that would uh, uh, undermine uh, uh, the efforts uh, by the position. And the related argument uh, that I'm making in the book is that learning is critical to this process, to the development of effective tactics. And uh, both the government and civic activists uh, can learn from uh, previous protest campaigns in the country uh, and also they can draw some lessons uh, for, by observing what happened uh, uh, in uh, countries uh, with a similar social uh, context. Uh, so the cross-national diffusion of ideas matters, as well as uh, the domestic history of civic activism. And uh, today I'm going to uh, just uh, briefly uh, situate this project in uh, existing social movement literature, uh, discuss my methodology, and uh, then uh, elaborate on my findings using the case of Serbia's uh, youth movement Otpor, uh, and then, uh, you know, point out my contribution to the literature and you know, answer any questions you might have about the other four cases, um, Belarus, uh, Ukraine, so, uh, Azerbaijan or Georgia. Uh, so there is uh, voluminous literature on uh, social movements uh, and uh, uh, scholars have developed uh, um, multiple arguments in time to try and explain 
why some social movements are more successful than others. And uh, one very prominent argument in this literature is that the political environment matters. Uh, um, so when there is an opening in the political environment, uh, uh, when the level of repression declines, uh, when um, the magnitude of press freedom increases, then uh, civic activists might seize this opportunity and take action. Uh, another major argument in this literature is uh, that uh, uh, resource-rich uh, uh, social movements stand a better chance of um, challenging the regime. Uh, because it takes a lot of resources uh, to mobilize uh, uh, the population uh, uh, and uh, to campaign for social change. And uh, furthermore, it's argued uh, that uh, uh, social movements need to rely upon a pre-existing uh, web of social networks uh, um, in order to mobilize. If we think about the US context, for example, um, the civil rights movement uh, in the United States in the 1960s, I think, uh, drew heavily on um, churches as a, a mobilization structure. Um, and um, in another context, in Poland, you know, labor unions uh, played a prominent role in uh, building uh, the solidarity movement. Uh, uh, so uh, there are maybe formal or informal social networks uh, uh, that would connect people uh, and uh, facilitate uh, mass mobilization against the regime. Uh, uh, but even if uh, there might be some change in the political environment, or an increasing flow of resources, uh, it still takes uh, a great deal of resourcefulness on the part of civic activists uh, to take advantage of all these opportunities. Uh, and uh, that's why I argue that uh, uh, the development uh, of uh, effect, uh, the use of effective strategies and tactics is critical to the movement's success. Uh, and in my book I distinguish uh, several social movement tactics because there are different constituencies that the social movement tries to reach. Uh, first of all, uh, the social movement needs to grow. Uh, the larger it is, uh, the higher the chance that it would uh, really threaten the regime. Uh, so recruitment tactics uh, are important uh, to the success of any movement and uh, furthermore, uh, oftentimes uh, youth movements uh, need to uh, find some allies uh, uh, in, uh, um, in the country or outside uh, to strengthen their position within the regime. Uh, for example, um, uh, youth movements uh, need to uh, get the word out uh, by publishing maybe some news reports or like, like giving interviews to journalists so they need to find them. so if there is uh, in fact in the country some um, independent uh, media outlet, independent TV channel uh, or newspaper then it increases the chances of movement success so, or if uh, uh, there is an active uh, diaspora that helps uh, uh, civic actors inside the country, uh, again, you know, it works to the movement's advantage. And uh, the third set of tactics that is important is uh, tactics to the uh, opponents, you know, how to fight the regime. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, the state is concerned, it also um, can use a wide arsenal of measures to crush dissent. It does not have always to rely upon blood force. Uh, so, in addition to state repression, uh, state authorities can use channeling, which is a subtle form of repression. When you don't attack uh, civic activists directly, but just uh, uh, cut their access to resources, for example, uh, in, uh, in Russia, well, in the aftermath of the revolutions, for example, they, government passed some laws that restricted uh, foreign funding for NGOs. So it did not attack a specific uh, social movement per se, uh, but it limited uh, uh, the opposition's access to resources and in the long run uh, media um, 
uh, it, it had some impact. Um, and uh, finally, the third uh, set of counter moves that the, the government might adopt is uh, the uh, establishment of uh, the for financial support uh, for youth-friendly youth organizations. So instead of just uh, uh, suppressing uh, youth mobilization against the regime, they would try to induce uh, compliant activism. Uh, and um, like in the Soviet times with Kosovo, uh, try to uh, boost the youth participation in regime-friendly organizations uh, uh, to signal to the society that uh, uh, young people are on the side of the regime rather than in opposition to it. Um, so to answer my research question, uh, I decided to use qualitative research methods uh, and um, I uh, uh, conducted the in-depth interviews with former youth movement participants. Um, so I made uh, several field trips uh, to the region uh, and uh, interviewed primarily movement leaders uh, because I was interested in the development and use of movement tactics and strategies. Uh, I felt that they were the group of people that would be uh, best suited to answer these questions. So, uh, and uh, you might be surprised how memories of this period are still alive in uh, the minds of um, uh, many people who are not students anymore. When I went to Belgrade in January 2008, uh, I, I took this picture because uh, it, downtown, you know, it, it has been uh, 10 years by that time since uh, uh, the establishment of um, Otpor, and, and still they had this uh, graffiti um, on one of the buildings. So you can see here the image of the clenched fist. Uh, and the slogan, one of the most popular ones at the time, here says, he's finished. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's what uh, they uh, were trying to suggest them. Um, that, you know, time, uh, it's time for the incumbent uh, uh, leader for Milosevic to step down, he's finished. Uh, and, uh, of course, when I traveled to Azerbaijan, uh, it, there was a totally different uh, uh, social environment and everywhere I went I could uh, see uh, some um, reminders of the cult of the personality that was promoted of the uh, Hidar Ali, uh, the father of the incumbent president at the time. So this is for example a like, picture of Hidar, the billboard with Hidar Ali um, and it was ever, there was a big monument built to Hidar Ali that was uh, uh, well guarded by, by the local police. Uh, uh, I also went to uh, Belarus, uh, Georgia uh, and Ukraine. If anybody is interested, uh, I can talk uh, uh, during q &A about uh, my experiences uh, uh, there. Um, and uh, uh, as far as um, uh, Soviet is concerned, uh, I think this is one of the most uh, fascinating cases. Uh, because um, Serbia, uh, Serbia's outpour can be seen as an uh, initiator movement uh, that uh, started uh, this wave of youth activism throughout the post-Soviet region. Uh, it provided a template uh, uh, that uh, uh, youth activists in other countries would try to adopt. Uh, and uh, one of the things that they were really trying to accomplish was uh, to build a horizontal organizational structure uh, that would be very different from what you would observe in opposition political parties where everything, where it looked like a pyramid, uh, where everything kind of focuses on uh, and revolves uh, around the leader of the opposition political party. Instead, uh, uh, they uh, try to send a message that any young person can become a leader uh, at the local level within uh, uh, a branch uh, and uh, can uh, um, put out ideas uh, uh, that um, would have an impact on the movement that can be adopted uh, by youth activists. Uh, and it does not mean that there were no leaders. There were leaders in place. 
but uh, uh, they wanted to, to, and they were really trying hard to promote the impression that it was a leaderless movement. So one of the things, for example, that they did was to rotate spokespeople. Uh, so instead of having just one person all the time uh, speaking on behalf of the youth movement, they rotated it. And uh, first of all, uh, it uh, uh, helped them uh, uh, disperse power. And second of all, it also sent a message that uh, uh, the movement was quite large, that it was not limited to a handful of people, that uh, there were different individuals who were uh, members of the movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, because oftentimes in other contexts we can see how there is just one person who is constantly on TV speaking on behalf of the whole movement of the whole party, uh, as if nobody else um, has um, any voice. Uh, and uh, what distinguishes Otpor was that it developed a two-track approach to civil resistance. It developed two distinct uh, campaigns. The first campaign was negative campaign. A title Gatovi, he is Finnish, that I mentioned earlier, and this is again another illustration of how they try to convey their message. This is a poster that they produced uh, on the eve of the national elections, and you can see here the first piece, so the date of the election, and uh, an image of uh, Milosevic exiting the stage. So I think it's, it was very smart, very clear. Uh, to the audience. So, uh, they really tried to pile all the, uh, the blame for everything bad that was happening in the country on Milosevic so that people could vote him out of office. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it was not enough just to cause disillusionment with the current uh, situation. At the same time, they also um, were successful in uh, implementing a positive campaign titled it's time, a <laughs> very uh, year, and uh, they were trying to suggest that it's time to act, uh, it's time to vote, it's time to protest uh, against the government, uh, uh, and uh, uh, opinion polls uh, suggested on the eve of elections uh, that uh, young voters, if they were brought to the polling stations, were most likely to vote against Milosevic. So, on the one hand, they were trying to just organize a get out vote campaign, uh, but on the other hand, uh, it was really uh, more than that. It was all, you know, it was uh, aimed uh, at voting uh, Milosevic out of office uh, by bringing uh, Indian voters to polling stations. Uh, and they did it in a very creative way. Uh, the, the opposition political parties uh, often recognized the rather boring events, uh, uh, protest rallies, uh, where you know a few old uh, politicians uh, would get on the stage and read their speeches. It was not appealing to young people. So they decided that they would try to engage in a constant campaign uh, and create a culture of resistance where Protesting against the government is uh, not just dangerous, but also cool. <laughs> uh, uh, so they uh, uh, produced the stickers, uh, they spray painted graffiti, uh, organized very humorous uh, street performances, uh, and uh, in collaboration with some other allies or rock concerts throughout the country. Uh, and they uh, and uh, and uh, I'll come back to this in a moment, uh, but another very important uh, tactic that they adopted was uh, to uh, cultivate uh, ties with um, influential allies, uh, cooperate with other non-government organizations in the country, um, but, uh, and also put pressure on the opposition political parties. Uh, when I interviewed Slobodan uh, 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 Popovich. One of the things that he mentioned to me was that uh, during the first uh, months, uh, like uh, during the election year, you know, one of the things that they did was uh, to push for the unity of the opposition political parties, that it, because it was very fragmented in Serbia, and they did not want to unite and uh, nominate a single candidate from the opposition. Everybody wanted to be uh, the guy on the ballot. Uh, nobody wanted to make compromises, so they had to really shame the political opposition 
uh, for their lack of unity and that's what uh, uh, they have focused a great deal uh, and also uh, what um, um, is distinct about Otpor was that it, ha it, was, it succeeded in building a large youth movement um, that was autonomous uh, from the opposition political parties uh, and uh, could really legitimately um, challenge them. Uh, another distinct feature of uh, the strategy was uh, a fraternizing approach to the police uh, because um, unlike uh, uh, protesters in the past, uh, they tried to reach out to the police and they try to say that the police officers, like everybody else in the country, uh, were victims of the regime. Um, and, um, you know, they, <coughs> they, they, were, they were trying to win the coercive apparatus on their side. Um, because it's often important. Uh, um, and uh, they learned from the previous mistakes. Uh, the youth movement outpour did not emerge out of the blue in 1998. Uh, a large uh, protest campaign uh, in which students from the University of Belgrade uh, and other two universities, major universities uh, uh, in uh, Serbia, the University of Novi Sad and the University of Nish, played um, a prominent role in the post-election protests in 1996-97. Back in that time, in 1996, local elections were held in Serbia uh, and uh, um, some opposition political uh, figures uh, uh, received votes uh, um, in city councils, uh, but um, the elections were won with fraud. So in the aftermath of these elections, uh, opposition political parties organized protests uh, and uh, uh, university students in Belgrade uh, organized their own protest marches because in addition to protesting against electoral fraud they also demanded the resignation of the rector, the president of the University of Belgrade. They wanted to see some change not just um, uh, in domestic politics but also um, at the university level. They wanted to have more autonomy, more academic freedoms. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's when, yeah, so uh, one of the comments um, that a participant in those protests made uh, during the interview was uh, that, you know, protest marches didn't work. They actually marched for several weeks, for, for several months. <laughs> uh, uh, and, um, you know, uh, it, it was uh, quite tiresome after some time, you know, to, to get up and march every single uh, day. Uh, but um, so, so they learned from it that they had to develop a, a wide range of protest tactics, not just relate to one of them. Uh, and they also realized that they had to spread out beyond the university centers and try to engage uh, uh, with youth outside the um, major universities uh, to um, uh, increase uh, uh, their impact. Um, so. Uh, the, it, it does require a lot of resources, uh, like financial resources, to display resourcefulness. Uh, uh, and I just want to illustrate it with one example, one of the street actions uh, that they organized uh, in Belgrade and other cities uh, was called Dinar for Retirement. Uh, first of all, it was a pun on the campaign that was organized by the government during the time called Dinar for Harvesting where they tried to raise some funds uh, for the agricultural sector. Um, so, civic, uh, so youth activists uh, placed a barrel in downtown uh, Belgrade uh, and uh, uh, they asked uh, pedestrians to donate a few coins if they wish uh, and in return they could take a bat and hit, it with, uh, uh, hit, the, uh, hit the barrel with a bat. Uh, so it was very simple, you know, it didn't require a lot of um, props um, uh, but, uh, and they even didn't have to observe it. Uh, they placed it and it, just once, uh, you know, a few people did it, uh, others uh, picked up the idea and they just started doing it. Um, uh, and and uh, <coughs> uh, 
when the police came, they were kind of at a loss what to do because uh, technically speaking, nobody was there to arrest. So they just arrested the barrel. <laughs> they just you know, took, took the barrel from, removed it from the place. And they invited journalists, so the journalists were there. Uh, and uh, then, uh, you know, the journalists uh, wrote, wrote reports, you know, with the headline, like, second barrel was arrested, third barrel was arrested. So it was a uh, um, you know, very simple, but, uh, but very effective. Uh, and um, uh, I think uh, for the first time in Serbia that they used the marketing techniques uh, on an unprecedented uh, level. Um, uh, and uh, uh, they produced uh, not just tickets, but also t-shirts uh, uh, and even a TV spot. <laughs> Um, I don't know if we have time for it, uh, I, if we can, I'm not sure, I, I guess I cannot show you, but uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but I mean, it's a... Uh, I think I, I, can, I can just give I mean, if not, I can just describe it. It's a, it's a short one. <laughs> I, Um, but, but I mean, <clears throat> uh, here uh, they have it, and she's speaking um, in Serbia and there are the uh, English subtitles. But basically, you know, she's showing the shirt, uh, t shirt, with an image of um, Milosevic, and then she puts it in the laundry machine, uh, and you know, she shows this symbol <laughs> on the clenched fist, uh, and uh, it's a typical kind of ad that you would find for detergents. And then, you see it works. Milosevic, the image of Milosevic is gone. And then it says here, yeah, like, uh, uh, vote, uh, and, uh, and it will be finished. <laughs> um, so, oh, sorry. I don't mean to interrupt, but where would that have aired? Would it have been on television? Yes, on the yeah, yes, it was on television. That's, that's the point I wanted to make, you know, like when I made this argument about the political opportunity structure. What happened um, in the aftermath of um, in the aftermath of these elections, the local elections, why the government was so outraged and tried to really rig the elections was because some city councils received, uh, were staffed uh, with a large number of opposition political parties and uh, representatives. And they were able at the local level, because the, the, the national government the broad, um, broad, uh, controlled the major TV channels, but at the local level, city councils had the right to set up local TV channels. You know, they would broadcast maybe just one city or you know, a larger area, like, uh, like a province or that. I, I, I think largely a city, like city councils. Uh, but, um, but, but at the city level, they gained uh, power to set up local TV channels. So then, our activists had to do the, the legwork and go from like one city to another, like negotiate at the local level uh, whether they would put these um, TV spots on. And so they were able to, to broadcast it this way, at the, at the local level, but not on national TV channels. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I spoke with the people who produced it, and you know, it, they were working in a in a ad agency. You know, they had some resources, um, and uh, and they used it. You know, they just uh, played around with this uh, very simple idea of you know uh, detergent and just uh, turn it around. So again, I think it's very creative uh, uh, and clearly. Um, it conveys, it conveys this, uh, this, uh, this message. Uh, and of course, you know, there are some critics who would say, oh, they got some CIA money, or like, like they got some money from the US government, from international donors. So, uh, I remember at that time, Serbia was isolated uh, in, uh, from the rest of the world. Uh, but there were some outdoor activists who traveled by car from Belgrade to Budapest <laughs> and returned back with uh, you know, suitcases full of money. Um, 
I think that by now, we, and they, they also admit that yeah, it, it, it happened, uh, but, but still, I would counteract with the argument that it was still up to this uh, young people to decide what to do with this money, you know, and it, 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 they were generating the ideas. So, um, you know, so money by itself is not a solution. Uh, and, uh, uh, and indeed, they were quite savvy when uh, they began to get attacked in the mass media as targets of the West. Uh, they actually convinced uh, some, local, uh, some local spokesperson some individual who had close connections with the Serbian diaspora abroad to come out and say, oh, this money came from Serbian diaspora. In fact, Serbian diaspora did not give them money. Uh, but, but, they, but, they, but they wanted to distance themselves as, uh, from, uh, from international donors. Uh, they wanted to, to, to emphasize the fact that they were the patriots, uh, not some sort of sellouts. So, so they use the the kind of they, they found an ally who would uh, counteract state propaganda, which I think was quite smart. Uh, and the government, of course, did not sit idly, but it was not as effective uh, uh, as innovative in uh, trying to uh, disseminate the movement. So, first of all, you know, it's very very common uh, in many countries. You know, the government tries to frame uh, the political position as a mercenary of like the West or some uh, foreign uh, government, uh, uh, some pockets of the West. Uh, and uh, when um, uh, the number of uh, uh, the size of the youth movement grew, uh, the government uh, launched a large uh, campaign arresting civic uh, youth activists and uh, uh, you know, detaining them and fingerprinting them. So it was a very kind of odd um, procedure, which usually is not used for, um, um, you know, for, like in regard to like teenagers who are in the street are spray painting graffiti. Uh, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, one of the government spokesperson even tried to claim that Otpor is a you know, fascist organization in the tradition of red brigades. Uh, and the state is entitled to use any method against it. Uh, but by the time the government unleashed all this violence against Otpor, Otpor has already established itself as a, a strong uh, organization, uh, a grassroots organization uh, uh, across the country, and even uh, organized uh, one of the street actions uh, where they would uh, come to the police station, you know, like in, in, uh, like in, front, uh, in front of the police station. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, local outdoor activists uh, would uh, stand there with a mic and uh, present themselves to the passers-by and, and uh, describe, you know, how they are living in this community, how they are not um, yeah, fascists or they are not for mercenaries, they are just uh, people like them. Um, so this uh, uh, propaganda campaign did not work. Uh, and, and just as a visual illustration of how the government tried allegedly to uh, smear the reputation of what power they produced this uh, type of um, sickness. Uh, where they like equated the uh, hot power with Martin Jugend. So it has kind of a double meaning. On the one hand it hints uh, at uh, Hitler Jugend, uh, the youth organization that was formed in Nazi Germany, uh, and it tries to tap into uh, anti Nazi sentiments in Serbia. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, it also uh, tries to tap into anti American sentiments in uh, uh, Serbian society at that time. Uh, and, uh, you know, Magdan here is kind of like good. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Uh, twisted way of spelling Martin Albright. <laughs> it's a reference to Martin Albright, who was a, 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 a secretary, uh, a State Department, uh, uh, sec uh, head of the State Department, and uh, you know. So they were trying to kind of to suggest uh, that uh, this uh, youth movement uh, uh, was uh, really uh, alien uh, to um, Serbia and. Uh, 
uh, and in response, uh, outdoor activists uh, uh, did not just uh, uh, sit silently, uh, they uh, uh, tried to organize uh, street actions uh, uh, in which they emphasized the love of the country and the fact that they are patriots uh, and, the, uh, and it, it was called because I love Serbia. Uh, they were trying to say that uh, you know, they are really trying to act in the best interest uh, of uh, their citizens uh, and they are not uh, a force uh, um, that uh, was um, counterproductive. Uh, so, so in summary, this is, uh, uh, th this is just uh, some of the actions, uh, some of the state counter moves taken by the Serbian government. Uh, uh, just lastly, I wanted to mention that uh, uh, the Serbian government did not really to invest into building a large youth movement uh, to counteract uh, the rise of Otpor. Uh, there were youth wins of uh, uh, regime-friendly political parties uh, um, and uh, some of them produced some like, TV spots where they tried to show uh, carefree life in Serbia uh, but of course you know uh, at that time you know inflation was high, employment was skyrocketing you know, uh, uh, and it just didn't reflect the reality, it didn't strike uh, a positive note with the majority of young Serbs. Uh, so, uh, just to wrap up, uh, so that we have time for discussion, um, I wanted to point out uh, that uh, in my project I try to contribute to, to three bodies of literature, first to social movement literature by looking at tactical interactions between the common government and youth movements. Um, there has been a lot of research focused on the importance of state repression and certainly structural conditions make a difference and in some environments uh, uh, like for example Belarus uh, it would take much more effort uh, to try and bring about uh, political change uh, because uh, just uh, uh, the level, the intensity of the repression is very high. Uh, but at the same time what I'm trying to show in the book is how um, some choices matter and um, yeah, and the civic activists need to really um, be very careful in, in developing their tactics. Uh, and the second, I'm trying to contribute to the literature on nonviolent action research. In the past, there has been a lot of pessimism about the impact of nonviolence. You know, there were some people arguing that uh, we can overthrow the regime only by using arms. Uh, and uh, nonviolent action researchers uh, tried really hard to demonstrate uh, through some uh, research that uh, uh, nonviolent action can also uh, produce desirable results. Uh, but oftentimes, they, uh, as a res because of this uh, kind of agenda, uh, they often overlooked uh, cases of failed mobilization. You know, a lot of people like to talk about Ukraine or Serbia, but uh, often forget about the other cases where uh, youth activists uh, attempted to use the same kind of tactics uh, and uh, they did not succeed in uh, mobilizing citizens against the regime. And finally, you know, I seek to contribute to comparative democratization literature uh, because oftentimes youth are left out of the accounts of electoral revolutions and they're just treated as foot soldiers who uh, um, insignificant and uh, unconsequential compared to opposition political parties or international donors. Uh, and uh, if we look at the map of the world uh, right now, according to the Freedom House, you know, uh, um, half, you know, half of the countries, you know, those who are colored the purple or yellow are not free. Um, so. There are still a lot of uh, um, um, uh, uh, there are still a lot of uh, non-government organizations, uh, uh, social movements, uh, children organizations around the globe that are trying to uh, push for political change and uh, bring about uh, free and fair elections and press freedom, uh, freedom of assembly. Um, to their countries. Uh, so there might be some takeaway messages for civic activists from this project uh, um, and uh, 
uh, one of the things that I'm trying to emphasize in my project is uh, that uh, uh, it's important uh, for civic activists uh, to uh, carefully uh, study previous episodes of contention inside the country and uh, oftentimes uh, um, civic activists need to go through several iterations, through several attempts uh, at regime change uh, before they succeed. And also as far as uh, uh, youth movements in particular are concerned, uh, uh, I think it's important for them to make sure that they uh, establish their independence from opposition political parties. Uh, uh, because unfortunately, oftentimes uh, the political opposition uh, treats uh, them with uh, little respect uh, and uh, um, does not uh, grant them autonomy uh, that uh, they aspire to have um, and are not as democratic as they you know, claim. So I'll end here and uh, if you have any questions uh, and um, uh, you want to talk about other cases uh, that I cover in the book, I'll be happy to elaborate on them. Thank you. Um, with regards to some of the other cases you had mentioned,